You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. I cannot believe it. It is three days to go until the Vet Rehab Summit, our annual online veterinary rehabilitation conference. The Online Pet Health team has been working behind the scenes for the last year, and we are ready for this Saturday, the 14th of November. It is going to be incredible, guys. With conferences all around the world being cancelled, we felt the pressure to put in an event that would wow you and that would connect you with vet rehabbers from all around the world. So as of today, we have 1,195 vet rehabbers registered for the Vet Rehab Summit. And it's no surprise that our theme for this year is connection. So if you've not got your ticket, it's not too late. You can go to vetrehabsummit.com. Now, online pet health members, of course, you guys get free VIP access to the conference. It includes 21 hours of CPD, access to all the discussion rooms and the around the world networking rooms. We know that for some of you, 2020 has been a really tough year. And so we have created a free limited access ticket. And so everyone can get access to the Unity discussion room, as well as a choice of one of our three live webinars on the day. And then to top of the day, we'll be announcing the IAVRPT Veterinary Rehabilitation Professional of the Year live at the award ceremonies. Who will it be, guys? We have eight amazing finalists. So I hope to see you all online this Saturday, the 14th of November, for this amazing event. So today, I'm going to be doing one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcasts, and I chat with Jess Dreyfus. She is the founder of Healing Paws in Florida in the United States. So in my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcast, we learn from vet rehabbers from all around the world how they practice vet rehab. They share their challenges, wins, and losses in the hopes that we can learn from their mistakes, and so we won't make the same ones that they did. They also share their tips and advice on how they navigate through this crazy world we live in today, and we get a glimpse into their vet rehab life. Over to Jess. Hey Jess, thank you so much for joining me. No worries. Thank you for having me, Meg. Jess, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into the field of veterinary rehabilitation? Um, Sure. So for me, it was actually because of my own dog. Um, I had a wonderful Cocker Spaniel that I still miss to this day. And he had a very, very rare liver disorder called hepatocutaneous syndrome. Um, I don't know if, if that rings a bell with anyone, but for me, we only had one slide on it for the entirety of vet school. Yeah. And of course, vet's dog, he got that. And the only thing that really helped him was all the modalities we used in rehab. Um, I went to every internal medicine specialist I called specialist in Europe on this disease. And the only thing that, ha- that, that helped him was what I do now. And that's kind of how I got started on that path. Wow. Yeah. I remember that condition. I remember it's yeah. actually um, from dermatology. Whereas you know, one of those kind of like when you see this kind of case, don't always just think it's a dermatological issue. They could be some other systemic um, condition. So just remind us and for those people that don't know about it, so what are the clinical signs and what, how would that kind of case present? Um, and what are the things that we'd be treating? Yeah, so um, it basically you, what you tend to see in the beginning are very unusual lesions at the mucutaneous junctions. Um, as well as the paw pads. So it's almost like the paw pads become extremely dry, brittle, a lot of extra dry skin there, and they're painful. They're really, really painful to walk around. And so when you're going through all of this, of course, it's an amino acid um, process. We don't really know why it happens or how it happens, but there's a lot of internal medicine stuff you have to do in addition. So he got a lot of IV amino acid infusions, but that wasn't enough what really made a difference for him was pain management control. So he was the kid who got acupuncture three days a week. He got laser therapy three days a week. Um, I also started him on herbal therapy and great supplements and great nutrition. And I had a dog who only had a life expectancy of about six weeks from diagnosis. And I had him for two years. And that was through everything I learned um, kind of in the rehab world. So for me, once that kind of um, opened the door, because I worked with a rehab therapist or rehab vet, 
and she showed me all of this and completely saved my dog, I, I looked at her and I said, okay, what do I have to do to do what you do? Tell me, like, what courses, what track do I have to take? I'm done. I want this. So yeah. you were a GP vet and then you decided, okay, this is, this is where I'm going. So tell us a little about yeah. that. So where did you study and then how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so um, that rehab vet, I, I absolutely love her. Um, we actually refer back and forth. I think she's just brilliant. Um, she looked at me and she, she said, you know, if you want to do this, it's going to be a lot of courses, a lot of time, a lot of money. Are you, are you sure this is what you want to do? And I said, yes, I love school. I love learning. I'm ready. Let's go back. Let's do it. And mm -hmm. so I, I went up to the Chi Institute that's only about six hours north of me. And I took the acupuncture certification, the advanced acupuncture certification, the food therapy course. And I was um, that nerd that sat in the front row. And I was such a nerd that they asked me to come teach. And so I, I try to teach there as often as I can with everything else that's going on. And then I also chose to get rehab certification through the Canine Rehab Institute. All right. Yeah. So now you have this practice. Um, yep. Tell us about the practice and how many people work there. So now I have a standalone rehab and acupuncture facility. And so we have myself, um, another veterinarian, Dr. Gersten, who's amazing. We have a fully stocked canine gym, a land treadmill, underwater treadmill, five exam rooms, which sounds like a lot, but I feel like we need a lot more. Um, as well as a staff of um, four physical therapy assistants and then a practice manager and another reception. So it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of people. So what is your consulting looking like? So how many days a week and what hours are you consulting? We're open six days a week. Um, and that, that to me feels great. I know that um, my business partners would like to do seven days a week or eight but I feel like six days a week is, is pretty good so that we can have a work-life balance. Um, yeah. We'll see anywhere from uh, 20 to 24 appointments or more a day. Um, mm -hmm. And that doesn't include if people are coming in just for adequate injections or any kind of mini appointments is what I call them. That doesn't include those. So we're, we're pretty busy and we're pretty fortunate during this time. So it sounds like you really need that practice manager. I do. <laughs> I do. I absolutely love her. She does such a good job. I'm, I'm constantly amazed by the number of things she does that I'm just not aware of. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'll, I'll walk up front and, and be like, oh, wow, that whole situation just happened. She, she just says, yeah, I took care of it. You're good. By the way, you're five minutes late for your next appointment. And I'll be like, I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah. You so need a person that just ties everything together because, um, you know, one of the things that I find so different with rehab is that um, it's so different to veterinary practice where like people come for a consult and then leave and um, otherwise they come get admitted and then they wait until another time in the day where the, you operate. Whereas with vet rehab, everyone's coming and going and going into different rooms and different things that are happening. Um, so you just really need that person to tie everything together. Um, and you need a really good practice manager to do that. They have to be somebody that is able to just multitask all the time, right? It's, it's amazing um, what she can do in one time. And, you know, case in point, I was watching her because I like to eat, come in even on my days off because that's, that's when you get that quiet moment to look around the practice and say, okay, how can I make this go better for everyone? And I was watching her and I, I thought, she needs a third computer screen. She absolutely does. And she needs a headset. Oh yeah, she needs those things. And I, I turned to her and said, hey, what do you think about this idea I have? And she was like, absolutely, that would be amazing. It's my command center. And it was, it was just great. So, I mean, you know, from the time, if you think back to when you guys didn't have a practice manager, um, you know, what has she taken over? Because, I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges. When you're a vet rehabber, you're doing all the consults uh, as well as managing all the people and it's so much stuff that you're trying to juggle. And, you know, most vet practices, I and mean, I think there are a lot of vet practices that when they start, they're also doing that kind of thing, but they very quickly need a receptionist, right? And then they start to take over. And I think that it's a struggle for all business owners. And um, a lot of other businesses, if you think about it, 
um, they have the people that, that do all the things in the business and then they sit and they manage, right? Whereas for us, for in the early days, we are in it. We are doing it a lot of the time. We were spending 80% of our time when we were at the practice actually doing the job of a vet rehabber. Um, so trying to find that time to juggle and do all the organizational kind of, kind of things is so, so tricky. So think back to that time and then you had to make that shift into actually getting someone. How is that practice manager now taking that load off? And, and how did you make that decision? Because it's a big one. It's like, can we afford to actually pay somebody to do this? Um, and are we going to have enough money at the end of the month? And should I maybe just carry on doing what I'm doing and just struggling? Um, you make very, very good points. Um, for me, I'm very type A and uh, sometimes I get into that mindset where, you know, my way is the best way to do it. I, I don't know why you even thought about doing it that other way. And so for me, it got to a point where I just started to look at um, how's my balance in my life going? Cause I always like to check that, especially at the beginning of every day, I do a daily practice and I kind of was like, I'm, I'm doing too many things. I'm diluting other things I'm really good at, like seeing patients because I'm too busy doing inventory and helping out with consultations. My time is worth it to get someone to help me do this. My time is worth it. And then I had to kind of advance to, okay, I need to be able to trust this person to take over these roles and be okay if she does it another way. At the yeah. end of the day, if the kids are doing okay, I, I call my patients kids then everything's going great, even if she didn't do it my specific way. So yeah, it was, it was a big leap. Yeah, and no regrets, right? No, oh my gosh, I absolutely love her. No, <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. It, was, it was phenomenal. I, I can't really go back and I tell my business partners that when we're going over finances and they say, you know, payroll is really, really high, just so you know, and I say no, but nothing, <laughs> I can't put a price on sanity. I'm sorry, yeah. I can't. No, it's it's going well. I'll figure out the rest. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone that ever regrets getting someone in to help them with all that kind of stuff. There's just no vet we have that regrets it. Listen, maybe you regret it if you get the wrong person in. Um, I, yeah, I could see that. But, but the help um, and how it frees you. And I think that we're better vet rehabbers when our mind is clear. Um, so I think back to for myself in those days, and I remember consulting and, you know, my, my mind was trying to focus on the clients and the pets. And then you're in those sort of quiet moments where you should actually just be hundred percent focused, but your mind's saying, oh, I mustn't forget to do that. I mustn't forget to phone that vet. I mustn't forget to do that. And so your mind is just, you know, and, and, you know, I remember getting my practice manager and just being able to be like in the moment, you know, like fully being able to treat that patient um, to the best of my ability and my mind being calm because somebody else has got it, you know? And like you say, like you come out and there's like a disaster that's happened and it's been sorted out. Um, you know, I used to hate being in consults and somebody coming in and saying, you know, this is happening. And you're like, well, can't you just do this? I don't know what to do, you know? And then when you got a practice manager, you're just completely oblivious, just doing what you do and what you're loving to do. Yeah, it's so, it's so golden. Whenever I see yeah. those moments, I just am like, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, where do you get most of your clients from? So are you getting them from referrals from other practices? I mean, I know that's something that a lot of vet rehabbers really struggle with. So I get 60% of our referrals from veterinarians and then 40% from Google. We do a great, great job with Google AdWords. It's, it's been a great learning curve to figure that out. Um, and an even better job with social media, which I absolutely love learning about. Yeah. So who manages those ads? Because that's one of the things, you know, like um, you think to yourself, like maybe I should just try and do it myself. Um, and I've learned with Google ads and Facebook ads, like, don't try and do it yourself. Like get somebody to do it, get it right. And then you can take it over. Um, but maybe you, maybe you've managed, maybe you've learned how to do it and you're doing it yourself. Um, I won't lie. So myself and then my, my family helps out a ton. I'm really, really lucky to have a family that 
Um, we're all entrepreneurs and we're all kind of in each other's business. So um, my father and brother actually already knew about Google AdWords from their business. So yeah. I was fortunate enough to just tap in with them and say, hey, do you think you could help me here? Yeah. And then okay. I, I completely love social media. So I taught them social media and they taught me AdWords. So it's, it's been a journey because uh, anytime you get family involved, somehow it feels personal. And yeah. so it's, it's great to over dinner say, Hey, did you see, I added this keyword and look what happened. I told you. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, can you, can you please pass the wine down here? Great. Good job. <laughs> so, and, and you know that you're getting all that traffic um, from Google analytics, from the analytics. Do. From your app, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's great. We print out the reports and we'll have kind of a meeting about everything and where we think it's going. And I, I love that. I try to help a lot of other vet rehabbers. I have a good colleague who's just starting and I'm trying to show her and teach her, you know, you've got to do Google AdWords. This is unbelievable. The return on investment is phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it's one of those things that when we look at paying for advertising, um, you know, if I think about myself, um, and now this was like back in the day now when social media wasn't even a thing. Um, so, I mean, I opened my practice in 2006 and I think I joined Facebook only in 2007. Um, so I got a little reminder the other day when I first joined. Um, and so for me and my practice in the beginning, you know, because social media was still building up, I used to like look at paid advertising would be to go in magazines and in newspapers and things like that. And even then, you know, like it didn't work, you know, it really wasn't working. Oh, wow. like to put yourself out there and just hope that somebody is in that moment where their needs are being okay. rehabber um, and the message that I put out there, they actually connect to it. Um, so like nowadays, I think when you're spending money trying to get people to your practice, um, most of the time it's online, right? Um, because that's yeah. where people are. Yep. And if you can do it really effectively and you can make it work, you can really seriously get a lot of traffic um, from it. But then there's also the organic side. So the organic social media side. Um, so like a lot of us, I think that are on social media, a lot of us that we have is maybe from lack of knowing what to do with Google and Facebook ads. We spend a lot of time on social media, hoping that we're going to get traffic to our website organically. And I think that you can do it. There, is, there are ways in which to do it. Um, so are you doing sort of a balance of the two? So are you sort of on social media um, in the paid sense, as well as um, sort of just having a presence there? We do. So I'll do Facebook ads as well as Instagram ads. Um, and that's helped. I will say Google AdWords, I think has helped even more because um, if you kind of just look around during the day, how many people are on their smartphones? When yeah. you do paid Google AdWords, you can go ahead and rank the highest and be at that top Google bar, which is invaluable. People are going to click that and follow through there. With um, social media, the ads really, really help, but I just haven't seen as strong as a, of a return on that. Yeah. Um, that said, I've got a few more courses I'm going to take online and, and try to see if I can improve that. Yeah. But I, I personally love doing social media. I get a kick out of it when I see that um, owners see that their pet has been posted and we tag and mention them and they just love it so much that they share it on their Facebook. And then I get three of their friends coming in because they saw Charlie getting laser and acupuncture on Facebook. Yeah. Um, to me, it just feels really, really good to kind of get that yeah so one thing i love about social media is it just blows up that word of mouth because it's yeah. like there's word of mouth where people are talking and then yeah. you know there's word of mouth on social media and you can go viral you know you can have a video yeah. of a patient and people are just sharing it all over the place you know um so yeah i mean i, I think that there's that dopamine release for when you're actually looking at social media yourself, you know, you get into that like addiction. But I think there's also dopamine for when you have your own page, right? When you yeah. put something out there and everyone is like engaging with it, it's like it's awesome, right? Um, so yeah, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna go and have a look at at, at your page, and maybe we need to get oh, you geez. get you on onto the business vet we have as Facebook group to do to chat about some of the the tactics and strategies for that sure. you. Um, in your ads so, yeah, um, so TikTok has been the newest thing yeah have you been doing that I have um, yeah. I, I was kind of making fun of it in the beginning I'm not gonna lie 
And now I, I think it's phenomenal. It's basically miniature video editing that you can do extremely quickly on your phone. That's all it really is. And uh, thanks to, to Trump, it's still going to be around. Um, it was going to be canceled yesterday, but then they sold, so everything's fine. <laughs> Tell me what happened. They sold TikTok. Uh, sold- I think uh, TikTok was uh, required to sell to some type of US-based company, from what I understood. And I believe they sold to Oracle, so TikTok's still alive. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, I think that Instagram has tried to take over a little bit, right, with their reels. Yeah, yeah be- I, I I haven't done that much, but I've enjoyed looking at TikTok and, and doing different things. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing is, my techs are so much better at it. They're all younger than me. Yeah. yeah. And they're just like, oh yeah, Doctor Jesse, let me do that two seconds. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. You're that's your new job. You get one TikTok a day. You do it. <laughs> yeah, but I think the thing with all of these things, so it doesn't matter what you're doing. All right. Whether it's ads, whether it's social media, you need to be getting a return. Okay. And yes. I think this is the, the one big thing um, that we have is sometimes do things with no idea as to why they're doing it. So they do them because they think they should be. Um, so when you're doing them, you need to be measuring and making sure that that's actually where you, uh, you're getting traffic from. So, I mean, your goal is obviously to try and attract new clients and to educate your current clients, right? So like on social media, you can have clients that you're actually building up relationships with them um, in order to help with your client retention. So it's really important that whatever you're doing, it should be moving the needle. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing it. You should be doing something else. And I think it's different for everyone, depending on where you are and what type of client base you have um, and where you are in the world. I think certain people in different type parts of the world are maybe doing things and Definitely that younger generation, I think, are on Instagram and now on the TikTok. I've looked at TikTok a little bit, but I'm still not 100% sure, like, how, like, are our clientele actually there? And I know I, the younger generation are there. And, like, how you make something that is quite, like, fun and jokey, like, I suppose you can, um, but how does that actually get you clients? Um, so I think it's one of these things that's going to develop. Um, and there's a guy, do you know him, Gary Vaynerchuk? I don't even know if I say his no. name. No. You must know him, man. Um, he, he's like one of these inspirational guys. And he started off like a wine company. Um, and his, his dad had a, a wine shop. And he started like doing YouTube videos, like talking about wine. And um, he now has like major, major businesses all like selling loads of things. He's got so many different businesses. He's like a serial entrepreneur and he has a massive following. Um, And anyway, like probably about a year or two ago, he was like, TikTok, you better watch it. Like if you're not on TikTok now, you're like, you're going to be way, you're you're missing on this opportunity. And um, so the more I see TikTok growing, the more I'm saying like, remember what he said, like you should be on there. (laughs) But uh, yeah, I still just haven't. I'm just, Still trying to like, you know, I think one of the things is so overwhelming, right? Social media. So you like have to find, and I always say to the vet we have, it's like find one platform that's really working for you and focus on that. And then you can dabble on the others. So I'm still dabbling there in, in TikTok. But Facebook for me is, is the platform that we're on. Um, so like, do, do you have like a primary platform that you're on? I really, really like Instagram. Yeah. Um, I think it, it gives me a really good ROI. I enjoy using it. I know how to use it. I love tagging and mentioning and um, we're really excited after I took another course just on Instagram I was uh, tagged by the dodo so that that felt really really good Um, that's a great that was a great return I was like yes this is amazing okay I see how to do this let's keep going Um, TikTok kind of just dabble in it because I just keep hearing about it and I when I hear about it I want to learn more about it and it's actually got a few veterinarians on there who do a great job yeah. And so for me, I'm, I kind of look at it and I think, okay, how can I adjust it to what I do and spreading yeah. the word about what I can do for your kid with these specific modalities in my training? Yeah. So can you give our listeners like maybe like two or three Instagram tips, your top tips for Instagram and how they can optimize yeah. using Instagram? Um, one is going to be hashtags. I know they look really silly. Um, when I first showed my mom, she was like, why are you putting that there like 50 times? You did veterinary medicine five different ways. 
And he said, I know because it's different. Those hashtags actually mean something when you see them at the bottom of the page, they're not random. The whole idea is to get people who follow hashtags to then see your exact post. Uh, the second thing would be mentioning um, or tagging if you'd like, uh, that would be a second and third thing. So I always try to go for what I call um, people I think will really, really like it. Um, that would be like my clients. I've got a full list. Um, when they come in for their consult, I actually write, what's your pet's Instagram name? Yeah. And I'm constantly yeah. surprised by people who say, why did you ask that? Yeah. And I say, well, don't you want to make your pet an influencer? And then I'm, I laugh so hard when the next week we get tagged in one of their posts because they opened up an Instagram account for their pet. And to me, that, that just, it just makes me laugh because I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. I get to see what Fluffy does at home. Thank you. And uh, they just enjoy tagging us and we repost all those things. And so the, the third thing then would be reposting. So if someone tags you, you should go ahead and repost that. Um, and there's a great app for that that lets you do it at no charge. And it just makes them feel really good that you acknowledged it and shows all your other followers that, man, I should be tagging them when I come in. I don't know why I didn't even think of that. So, yeah. So do you find that a lot of your clients tag you in? So are they a lot of your clients tagging you? Um, a lot of my clients, I have um, kind of two populations. One is kind of the older population because I'm in, in Florida, so you knew that was going to happen. And then I've also got the millennials who um, I'm, I always get really surprised when they tag us and I find out their kid has like over 75,000 followers and I'm just like, well, you could definitely teach me something. Wow. Yeah. And so it's, it's just a complete dichotomy. Um, I won't lie. I still get some people, um, just a handful that say I don't have Instagram and I also don't have an email address. And then I'm like, Oh, okay, well I can help. What do you need? <laughs> do you actually ask them? to tag you in posts when you see them taking pictures and do you ask them or do you just like um, you're asking them about what their handle is um, yeah. on, their, on your welcome page. They're already immediately thinking, Oh wow, they must be on Instagram. Let me find theirs. Um, yeah. And are you finding them like right away there as they're filling it in? Then they're like looking for you on Instagram and following you. Yeah. Yep. So especially during COVID um, I send out all of our questionnaires before they even come in the door or I should say when they park. So they've got all that at home and I typically have all their information back before I even see the pet. Um, yeah. On top of that, I make sure that all of our Instagram, all of our handler names are everywhere. So they're on the bottom of every email. Uh, they pop up on our website. They go out on our e-newsletter. They go out on our blogs. Um, and then I even, even made one of our technicians write a really, really pretty uh, chalk paint. Um, our Instagram name and everything. So now when people are in the parking lot, because I consider, you know, if you're going to sit there and wait, wait for your kid for 30, 40 minutes, let's try to make it fun for you. So we have flyers and handouts and then a big at Healing Pause Center 954 on the window and clients love it. Um, yeah. That's another opportunity for me to say, hey, I know you're sitting there. I'm taking care of your kid. Do you want to go see some videos about other stuff that we do? I know you're sitting there. Let's try to make it fun. And so are you asking them permission to post pictures straight away, like on that, yes. uh, that sheet whenever they sign in from the beginning? Yep. Because I mean, that's one of the things yes. if you haven't done that. Then when you take the pictures, you got to ask individual like permission. Can we use this yep. image, for your pet? Um, so right away from the beginning, you got to put that in there. Are you asking? And then like, how, how do you manage that? Because if, you know, maybe there's one or two that are not saying you can have permission. Then do you have like a big, thing on the computer like don't take pictures of this patient or you can't post pictures on Instagram yep I, I really only have like you said one or two clients who um I'm not sure why but they're just not comfortable and yeah. so that's that's totally fine so we make sure that they've got it written on their patient schedule on their online medical record um just just everywhere um hey don't take pictures of this kid the owner is not comfortable and we need to respect that but it's, it's literally two kids and I can name them off the bat because the rest of the, uh, everybody else says, absolutely. I saw you make that video last, last month. Why didn't you feature my kid? And I'm like, Oh, I'm so sorry. All right. We'll work on it. <laughs> I love how, I love how you refer to your patients as kids. They absolutely are. <laughs> yeah. um, I tell all of my owners when they come in, you know, I, you get those questions. Well, what would you do if it was your baby? 
And I always say, look, I, I only make patient schedules and treatment plans based on yeah. what I would do for if my, if your kid was my kid, that's the only way I work. And I'm very honest. And I'll tell you if I think you need to go back for blood work and x-rays, I'm not going to do something I'm not comfortable with, period, full stop. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, one more question about the Instagram and social media. So if you're looking at um, your relationships now with the vets, so you're obviously getting referrals from them too. How do you utilize social media to solidify those um, relationships that you have with them? Are you tagging them into, are you trying to get them to tag you? Yep. So I'll, um, I'll tag and I'll mention them, which are two different things. Um, if you look on your Instagram page, you'll see you can tag. And then mentioning is doing a little at symbol with your handler name. So I'll do both. And sometimes I'll even text the vets because I, I make a point of saying, hey, I'm, I'm always available. This is my cell phone. Are you comfortable um, contacting me via cell phone and me contacting you? And I would say 10 out of 10 times the vets say, absolutely, please. Thank you so much. It's so much quicker to talk about patients this way. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and text them and say, hey, I'm tagging you guys with this kid. Have a great day. And yeah. I, I absolutely love it. Um, I would say most of the veterinarians um, are like, oh, great. I have no idea who runs the social media here, but thanks. Um, one or two who kind of run their own businesses will say, great, we're going to repost that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, after I, I taught them the repost up. But yeah, so I, I make sure that we're all in communication. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way because it's one of the things that people are struggling with is trying to get hold of the vets, you know. And, yeah. you know, like as a vet yourself, you know, what our day is like when we were doing GP practice. I mean, you just come in there and you're flat out. You don't even have a chance to eat. I mean, you know, it's like eating in between like quick toilet break back into consult and it's just flat out. Um, so, you know, when that vet rehab therapist phones or pops in to see you, you're like up to here with paperwork and everything that you need to do and phoning clients. And you don't have a chance sometimes to speak to them, although you maybe want to. Um, you don't. And um, so to be able to get them and especially WhatsApp, I mean, I really love WhatsApp. Um, so if you're able to build that relationship to the stage where you can WhatsApp or text them, it's that communication that you can just let them know something and they can message when it's convenient for them back. Um, but at least you're getting that message to them. Because I sometimes think like if you're emailing them, there is somebody else who's, e who's reading the emails and actually deciding whether this is an email that goes to the vet and maybe they like deal with it themselves and maybe just put a little update in the notes on the computer and maybe you miss that actual connection and, and communication. And I think for them, you know, mentioning them and tagging them in a post, they really feel special. Like, wow, like you really made this effort. Um, so it's a great, yeah, it's a great way to communicate with vets. I like it. Yeah, I, I love it. And I think my favorite is um, I'll send them video clips, especially during COVID. We do a lot of videos. So I'll go yeah. ahead and send them a video clip from today's physical therapy. And yeah. so they can see an update on their patient in about 20 seconds. Yeah. And a video speaks volumes versus me just saying, hey, looks like we've got greater hip range of motion. I'm seeing increased weight bearing. I kind of send that and I say, look, I'm really thrilled with how we're doing. It's been two weeks. I just wanted to give you an update. And the yeah. vets constantly write back, thumbs up. This is phenomenal. Thank you so much. Um, can I call you later about another kid I just saw? And that, that kind of keeps me in the forefront of their minds. So I, I love that part. Yeah. So those videos, I mean, how are you managing all those videos? <laughs> you're saving them and how are you getting them? Because like, I mean, <laughs> I think about myself, you know, it's the kind of thing that I would have loved to have done, but it was always an obstacle. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, I, I didn't consult so long ago. But like, I mean, I remember having like being able to film. Um, I don't yeah. know if it was yeah, in the early days whether we could film. I can't even remember that far whether we could film or not. But I remember having like a camera um, that I bought specifically for the practice. It was an underwater one. I remember. I oh, wow. You know, yeah. Um, I got it when I went to, on a trip to the States. I bought it, I remember. And I thought I was so professional with my little underwater <laughs> camera. Um, but I remember just being a mission, you know, like filming and then having to plug it in in the computer and download it. And, you know, and then it was always an afterthought, you know, I was always like, oh, I should have recorded that. I should have recorded that. And then I'll record like, I thought, oh, if only I'd record it then. Um, so how do you manage it? How do you encourage that um, to happen in your clinic? No, it's, it's a good point. I'd say constant reminders. Um, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things that I get 
um, from my staff is how much they love it when I take footage, like before and after footage, and I yeah. put it to music and I put it on our YouTube site. And they yeah. completely are like, oh my God, we're putting this all over Facebook. Everyone is so thrilled. Thank you so much for doing this. And I reinforce, hey, I couldn't have done this if you hadn't taken that video during rehab. So thank you. Um, yeah. All of our physical therapists go ahead and film during their sessions, especially during COVID, because the owners aren't allowed in the building. So they're required to go ahead and film. Uh, I'm so glad everybody has a smartphone so they can literally set up on these tiny little tripods, take videos. I figured out how to drop them into Google Drive on their, yeah, exactly. Um, I figured out and, and taught them how to drop those videos into Google Drive. And then they share the link on Google Drive to the owners via text because we've got a software that allows us to text immediately. And yeah. it was really challenging in the beginning, figuring out how to do this very smoothly. But now it's second nature. Now, now the text actually will come and yell at me, hey, the Google Drive is full. Did you empty it, Dr. Jesse? And I'll say, no, I need to do that. Thank you for reminding me. I'm really sorry. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Jess, it's been so amazing chatting to you. And, um, you know, like there were so many other things that I wanted to chat to. <laughs> like, we, we went down this little like social sorry. media hole, and um, I didn't realize you were like this, like, bit. I was going to say tech, but it sounds like a vet nurse, but like techie as in like so good with social media and all that kind of thing. So um, we yeah, definitely have, have to get you back on. I think we're going to have to dive deep into some of those topics. So sure. I really I appreciate it. your time. Thanks so much um, for sharing. And um, yeah, have an awesome day. You too. Thank you so much, Meg. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers. So if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.